How you doing today? Hope you all had a pretty good weekend. Hope things were interesting. Hope you did some fun stuff. I don't know. But, but anyway, uh, welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. And uh, hope you're all nice and rested and ready to start learning about something new. Because we are moving from bridge design to everything design. Uh, we're going to be starting with AutoCAD Fusion 360. Which we'll get into what exactly that is and how to use it in a little bit. But what I wanted to ask first is a uh, show of hands. How many of you guys have already downloaded it? I'm not... I actually forgot to check and see if there was a post on a moto from Mr. Dubik or an email. Okay. Uh, show of hands. Uh, who still needs to download it? Okay. Uh, no problems. No problems at all. Uh, we'll go ahead and go over the process of getting everything ready first, uh, so that while it is downloading, uh, I can start talking about what exactly this program is and what it's used for. So first things first, uh, we're going to go to this particular website. It's uh, Autodesk's website. Um, where you can you can download Fusion 360 for free as a student. Uh, just keep in mind uh, there are some requirements. You need to have a 64-bit processor, which pretty much everybody should have nowadays. So I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, and you either either be running Microsoft Windows 7, 8, or 8.1, or uh, Mac OS 10.9 or later. So Mavericks are later and it is recommended to have 4 gigs of RAM. Um, Windows 10, I hope should be okay. I don't have the ability to test that, and I don't think that's actually one of the things that's listed on the website. Um, but let's see. I'm guessing you already have the older version, Aiden, since you, since you knew that. So anyway, um, CAD is an acronym actually stands for computer-aided design. Uh, and this just basically means the ability to draw things with your computer. And this can be from uh, a prototyping standpoint, so like an engineering design, uh, designing you know machine parts and things like that. It can be from an aesthetic standpoint, so character design or uh, you know uh, like a, a spaceship for a video game or something like that. Um, but CAD software has actually been around for a long time. AutoCAD, the company that creates Fusion 360, uh, was actually the uh, the first company to create anything like a CAD um, style software. And that was way back in 1982. And it wasn't that great. You could create squares and circles. And that's it. But, you know, rest assured, if you had some sort of design that involved Squares and circles. AutoCAD was right there for all of your square and circle needs. Um, but as computers, you know, got more complex, they were better, you know, better resolutions, better able to handle 3D, uh, uh, 3D drawing and processing, uh, more memory, things like that, faster. Uh, AutoCAD also became more complex, and as it became more complex, it became more uh, integrated into the design industry. So now you can actually make anything from very simple stuff like a doghouse or a, um, you know a paperweight or whatever uh, to very complex things like entire cars or manufacturing plants. You can lay them out in CAD. Uh, you can you can create uh, character models and things like that for video games. You can you can do a lot of things with CAD nowadays. And uh, in order to assist that. There are many different variations of AutoCAD, which are used by every branch of engineering pretty much nowadays. Um, and each branch of engineering has their own specific style or you know flavor of AutoCAD. So civil has their own. Um, civil engineers have their own that allow them to design uh, buildings and bridges, as well as you know simulate traffic flow and things like that. Uh, mechanical can use AutoCAD to build. Uh, very complex machines or simple machine parts, so from cars to car crushers, <laughs> this example. Um, electrical uh, can make electronic boards. Uh, PCB. PCBs are pretty cool. Uh, PCB stands for printed circuit board, 
and uh, it's actually a thing where you can um, design it on the computer and then print out a, a sort of a mask to put on um, a PCB and then dip it in some acid and boom, circuit board. And that's all you need to do, which makes it really easy to prototype new circuit boards because if, the, if it doesn't work properly, you can just make some small changes in your, uh, in your you know, digital version, print out a new mask, put it on a new thing, dip it in some more acid, you got another electronic circuit board to work with that's updated. And it took you all of maybe, you know, max like 20 minutes of actual labor. There, there's usually some waiting around involved with the acid bath, but it's not terribly long. But yeah, CAD programs are not limited to strictly engineers. Graphics designers use them. Um, video game makers use them. Uh, graphics designers, you know, will make like uh, buildings and things like that that they can put onto posters and also for prototypes to show to investors so that they can actually get started in the engineering thing. Uh, video game makers, like I said, create characters, spaceships, you know, cars, just all kinds of assets that they can throw into a game. Um, and, you know, if you're like making a game with Unity, you can throw these assets into the Unity um, program and include them in your game. Uh, hobbyists can use CAD programs in order to create uh, designs for like a new shelf or something like that, that that they can you know then build and put into their house or like if they're customizing the motorcycle or something like that they can create a seat whatever you know just whatever you're whatever you think of you can probably design it and build it using CAD there are a whole bunch of different companies nowadays Auto AutoCAD used to be the uh, used to be the original uh, or Autodesk, rather. Um, but, you know, nowadays there's SolidWorks, which is a very popular one, uh, SketchUp, which is free, there's Creo, there's Blender, Blender's also free, um, Art of Illusion, you know, it's, it's, the market has definitely increased in size with new, uh, with new CAD programs. Some of them are more on the engineering side, like SolidWorks or SketchUp, whereas some of them are more on the graphic design side, like Blender. Blender, Blender you could use for engineering purposes, but it's definitely more on the uh, the graphic design side. And just a few examples of some things you can make. Like you can make a birdhouse, or you can make a sort of silly anchor thing. Um, this looks kind of neat, but yeah. Uh, it can go all the way up to incredibly complex, like the Serenity, or a fighter jet, or a motorcycle, or the... the Batmobile tank from the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, and these are all made up of indiv individual parts all attached together. So they drew the individual parts, and then um, attached them all into one, you know, larger entity. So it, the, to be able to draw something like this takes significantly more time than something like this, but both are definitely doable in CAD program. Oops. CAD programs. We did that. Uh, we went over this. Presumably everybody's downloaded it by now. And once it's downloaded, Autodesk is, or uh, Fusion 360 is going to open up. And it's going to ask for your Autodesk ID or your email address. And it's going to ask for the password. So this is the, the user ID and the password that you created on the download page. Just, you know, for, for clarity's sake. Um, and that will... Uh, that will allow you to sign in. And the reason that it's necessary is because uh, all of your projects get saved, well, they can get saved in the cloud. Uh, they can get saved online so that you can go to another computer, sign in with the same Autodesk ID and password, and pull down a project that you worked on at home. That kind of a thing. Uh, a lot of a lot of companies now are moving towards cloud storage and things like that uh, to better um, sort of share uh, things across the across distances, also to better make use of the resources that the internet has on, like at hand, uh, the the uh, to free up space in your computer. Just really a bunch of different things. Anyway, uh, once you've signed in, you'll have to agree to the terms of service, and just you know click a checkbox that says I agree to the Autodesk Fusion 360 terms of service. Click continue. 
uh, is an interesting note. Um, terms of services are incredibly long and also incredibly dense, uh, as in a lot of reading. It would take, there was a study done, it would take approximately 76 work days to read, and that's working 9 to 5, just not doing nothing but reading terms of services. It would take approximately 76 work days to read all the terms of service agreements the average person accepts in a year. So that is just two and a half months of straight up reading them for seven to eight hours a day. That's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, legal speak. Like, a lot of it. And it's always just kind of interesting, you know. It's 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 a good idea, generally, to, to, to at least get an idea of what you're getting into. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's a lot to read anyway, so that's... For simplicity's sake, we're agreeing to it now, but, yeah. And you're going to want to accept this top check mark, too. Uh, by installing the software, I accept Autodesk's license and services agreement for this product. Um, now you might have a couple more check boxes down below, uh, you know, uh, allow you to send anonymous information to Autodesk, um, more, more or less anonymous, not perfectly anonymous, but, um, more or less so, because Autodesk will then send more personalized emails to you about information and stuff like that if, you know, you agreed to that earlier. And then there's a more involved one, the Customer Involvement Program, which, uh, entails more uh, sort of communication on your end with Autodesk and things like that. Uh, you don't have to check either of those in order to continue and you know you can check one or the other if you if you'd like but it's not yeah you know, it's not necessary at all just that top one. Once that's all done, once it's all installed, you should hopefully have an icon on your desktop. And, uh, let's see here, I can indeed verify that there is an Autodesk Fusion 360 icon on my desktop. You guys might want to do the same. Well, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Move that back over here, and give it a minute to start up. I'm running a few things all at once, and it's, it's a lot of work that the processor has to go through. And then you should maybe be looking at something like this. You might get a tutorial window that pops up. You can, you know, click at a later time or click the X, and it'll, you know, uh, hide it. Uh, for the time being, it'll tell you how to find it later on, but you don't have to do that right now. Uh, there's... Anyway, uh, that's neither really here nor there. Once you get rid of that, you should be looking at a screen like this. And you've got a grid, that's sort of a three-quarters view. You've got a little cube up here, you've got a bunch of stuff. So let's spend a second talking about what exactly is on here. So first of all, on the far left-hand side over here, you've got the browser. Now the browser is sort of like a tree that um, makes it easy to see all of the components in your project. So you remember how I was saying that something like this, uh, like the Serenity over here, is going to be a bunch of different little parts all kind of slapped together, like individually drawn little parts that are all kind of slapped together into one unit? Well, this project browser over here, this thing, the, the browser over here would list, uh, these are the name views, never mind, um, would list the, uh, the different components of your overall project. So you'd be able to see, like, you know, the little things, the, the, you know, the little kind of circles and stuff like that that all go into making the, the nacelle over here and the, 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 the engine and everything. Uh, they'd all be listed over here. Uh, you also see a few things like the units, and name views, which is uh, just different views of the object that you can that you can save, so you can go back to them later quickly. Up here is the toolbox, which inv uh, includes all of the tools you will need for drawing and uh, creating three-dimensional objects in Autodesk. So, or Fusion. So that's uh, that's useful. 
you're, you're definitely going to be spending a lot of time utilizing this thing or the stuff on this thing. And then over here, you've got the view cube. So now the view cube uh, gives you an idea of what perspective you're looking at your project in. So you'll notice there's a top, a front, and a right. So if there was a cube right here, this would give you some idea of how you're actually looking at the cube. You can rotate it by clicking and dragging. So now we're looking at the back of the object, now we're looking at the bottom of the object, the left side of it, you know, the front of it, you get the idea. Alternatively, you can also click on a part of the cube to go there. So I can click on that, or I can click on the face, and it will move it to um, that particular view. For now, though, in the upper left-hand corner, there's a little house here. We're going to click that to bring it back to the default view um, until we start drawing. So we're going to keep it on the default view until we start drawing. Uh, alternatively, you can also use the orbit uh, tool down here in order to look around on things, but that's just an alternative way of looking at things. It's not necessary. You can use either one. And you got a few more down here we're not going to worry about uh, right now. But, yeah, there we go. We already knew about that. We already knew about that. Uh, yeah, so th th I, I should also mention that real quickly. This this is actually, you're going to be making a fair amount of use of this as well. Um, because, as you might imagine, you're drawing a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional plane. Uh, specifically, your monitor. So, in order to get an idea of what your thing looks like, you have to look at it from multiple different angles. I mean, you have to look at a three-dimensional object from multiple different angles in real life anyway in order to get an idea of its shape and everything like that. But this is especially true with a two-dimensional plane that you draw upon because otherwise the perspective gets kind of skewed and wonky and it just it doesn't really work out. Uh, so this gives you a better idea of your project. You can also, like, just in case you draw something but then you forget to close up the back, you can swing it around to the back and take a look at it and make sure everything's all in order. But for now, though, we're actually going to get started on our first incredibly simple project. So we're going to go up here to the toolbar, and there is an option sketch. You'll notice that there is an icon over sketch, and then that uh, darkens when you mouse over it. And also the word sketch gets darker when you mouse over it as well. So there are two different things you can click on. Now the top one is just, I believe, your most often used, or it might be one that you can change, if I remember correctly. But anyway, uh, tool in the sketch um, menu. Alternatively, you can click on the word sketch and bring up a menu of all of the things you can do under sketch. So you know you can make a rectangle a few different ways, you can make a circle a bunch of different ways, you can make an arc a few different ways, you can make a polygon, which is just, you know, any number of sides, you can make an ellipse, uh, you can make splines, curves, points, add text, things like that. For now, we're going to start simple with a line. So just go ahead and click on that. It's going to bring up this weird looking thing. So we've got three squares all looked at like at angles. And uh, if you mouse over a square, it actually moves the plane of drawing to align with the square. So as you can see, if this square is highlighted, you notice we got a plane that kind of, I don't know how to represent this because I was just about to gesticulate with my hands, which wouldn't have really been helpful, but um, the, the drawing plane becomes parallel to that. Likewise with the, uh, this square over here and likewise with the bottom square. And you'll notice that we've got these, these uh, orientations on the cube. We've got top, we've got right, and we've got front. Well, it kind of looks like these all align with one another. It's not perfect, I mean, because it's weird, you can imagine it kind of like being inverted, but top, front, and right. So, in that sense, we'd be drawing on the top of the object if we selected this one, we'd be drawing the front of the object if we selected this one, we'd be drawing the right of the object if we selected this one. Now, there isn't really any rhyme or reason to picking the correct one. You don't need to pick any particular one in, uh, at any point in time. Um, that's all dependent upon you know, the the needs of your project. So it might be better for you to start drawing 
uh, the, the right hand side of the object and then worry about the details on the front and the top later. It might be better to start from the front. It might be better to start from the top. You know, there's no um, there's no standard in that sense. However, there is a rule of thumb, and that is the front plane should probably have the most details. So that is to say, you know, if you're doing like a if you're doing like a I don't know like a like a person's face or something like that, you'll have the front plane um, showing their their face. So the that is to say, we would select this one and draw the face on it. As opposed to like selecting the top plane and then you know drawing the face here. For now, though, uh, because we're drawing something really ridiculously simple, we're going to start from the top plane. So go ahead and click the bottom square, and your perspective should change so that you're looking at something like mine. So you've got two axes, you've got a grid, um, and then you've got some measurement over here on the side. And of course, you got you got your cursor, which is creating a crosshair at its points. And then there's a little line uh, icon, like up here, uh, on the bottom corner of the crosshair. So if you notice, if you move it to an intersection, there's a blue square which is created. And also, if you move it over the circle in the middle, or like where the, the two colored axes meet, um, that circle also gets highlighted with a square. That circle is the origin. So that, that is um, where all three axes meet. That is the center of this um, collection of planes with an E. Yeah, the ones that don't fly, the ones that are flat. Um, so it should be, it should be, uh, it should be said that um, most CAD programs require you to start from the origin. You need to start from the origin because the drawing needs to have some sort of relation to the origin and the reason for that is because the program needs to be able to keep track of it so that it can redraw for later. Um, uh, there are a fair amount of CAD programs out there which are simply just sort of collections of points from the origin so they're, you know, they need to know how your uh, drawing is connected to the origin in some way. Not necessarily literally connected but you know maybe you move it over or something like that but somehow connected to the origin. Um, Autodesk Fusion does not have that requirement. So you can start drawing wherever you'd like and it's all fine. <laughs> On the other hand though, many 3D printing programs and stuff and things like that require some sort of relation to the origin so that they know where to start printing and they know whether or not this thing is going to be um, small enough to fit on the printing plane and everything like that. So, in general, you want to start your drawings at the origin, which is exactly what we're going to do here. So we're going to highlight the, uh, the origin, click, and then just bring the mouse downwards until we have a nice 100 millimeter long line. And then click once you've got the cursor where you want it to be. And you should notice that that line you were, you were, you know, uh, that line that was being created by your cursor moving around has turned blue. And you've got another line which is tracing from the end of that blue line to your cursor now as you move your cursor it changes. This is because basically to make it simpler you just it's set up so that you're continually drawing lines until you tell it to stop drawing lines. So we're going to tell it to stop drawing lines by hitting the escape key. If you can't get it to be 100 millimeters exactly, I should have said this earlier, I apologize. If you can't get it to be 100 millimeters exactly, don't worry about it. Not going to be a huge issue, we can fix that later. Um, but, you know, as close to 100 millimeters as you can make it. If you can make it exactly, perfect. If not, no big deal. So congratulations, you've drawn your first line in Fusion. Woo woo. So, there's another thing that, uh, we already did this, all of our drawings will start at the origin, blah blah blah. Um, Fusion, you can draw more or less anything. 
it's a little bit of a contradiction from earlier where I said you can if you can dream it you can draw it I mean you can dream really weird stuff like things that curve in on themselves and don't make any sense so those kinds of things aren't really going to be possible in fusion everything needs to be dimensioned in fusion basically measured out in fusion um, in order to you know show that it's valid and everything like that so you have to include dimensions like you, the length the width and the height of components and assemblies in um, fusion now these are also really helpful because being able to, like if you have everything dimensioned out then you know how long everything is uh, or you know how wide or how deep uh, and then you can make sure that everything lines up properly and you don't have like dead space in your in your drawing or anything like that or two things look like they're connected but in reality they aren't because they're just ever so slightly too far apart or they kind of overlap each other um, so that's why stuff like dimensions and measuring uh, in, uh, in Autodesk uh, Fusion are important especially when you're drawing a 3D object on a 2D plane so with that in mind, we're going to go ahead and dimension, or measure out, this line right here. We already know it's 100 millimeters or close to it, but we need to basically make it official with um, with uh, Autodesk. And that is going to be under Sketch. So if you go back to Sketch, you scroll down to Sketch Dimension, um, just go ahead and select that and then if you highlight the the blue line it should turn gray you can click on it and then it you will be able to draw this uh, this gray line or almost black line away from it that has a number on it um, so you know move your cursor some distance away left click and there you go you should see it turns white this is the dimension of the line that you created. So whatever this number is, is exactly how long this line is. In my case, 100 millimeters. Cool. If it's not, you can type in just like 100, and the line will automatically resize itself to be that length. So like, say I wanted it to be uh, 110, you'll notice that the line got longer. Because it automatically resized itself in order to be 110 millimeters. Now, Um, if you get into engineering, or when you get into engineering, you know, if you if you decide that it's still for you and you get into engineering and everything like that, and you start using something like this in the future, you're probably going to have to get to be more comfortable with metric units. Um, because metric units are just in general, they're, they're easy to work with. However, uh, since we, you know, here in America, we grew up with imperial units. Uh, let's go ahead and convert everything over to inches for our own use right now. So the way we do that is we go over to the browser, and you'll notice that there's like a piece of paper with a ruler on it at the bottom. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I had to cough. Uh, there's a piece of paper with a ruler on the bottom over here, and it says units millimeters. If you mouse over it, there's another icon which appears that has a pencil which allows us to change the active units. So go ahead and click on that. It should bring up a new window. In the drop-down menu, change that to inch, and hit OK. What this will do is we'll automatically change everything to be in inches. You'll notice that your grid look changed and looked all weird and everything like that because the grid resizes itself uh, in order to be in whole units, or at least close to whole units. So what was once nicely on the grid the sketch dimension was once nicely on the grid, now it is slightly off and we have a line length of 3.937 inches so it got kind of wonky but we're gonna go ahead and resize the line anyway so double click on the sketch dimension it still says 100 millimeters if you just type in 5 and nothing else and hit enter this will res uh, resize itself to be 5 inches just like a, just like I promised. It's perfect. So now we've got a five inch long single line. 
that's, I mean, really, so far, we've done a whole lot of nothing. But that's okay. We're going to get more done. And we're going to have a whole thing of something. A whole bit of something. That's, yep. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, we're going to continue using the line tool. So the line tool up here, uh, in this case, we're just going to go ahead and click the, the icon because we already know that this represents the line tool. We're going to use that. So you're going to start the line at the bottom of the blue line that already exists. So not at the origin, but where the line ends on the other side. So you're going to start there, click once, once it's got you know the blue square around it, and then just go directly to the right. You're going to go out five inches directly to the right. You'll notice that the um, some of the blue line disappears when you're drawing this next line. That's okay. It'll come back. Don't worry about it. Um, so once it hits five inches, click once. You should have two blue lines now at a 90 degree angle from one another in the exact same length. Both of them are five inches. But wait, there's more. So now we're going to go straight up from here. Five inches. So we're going to go to the red axis. Click again. And then once more, draw five inches, draw a five inch line until you reach the origin. Once the origin is highlighted blue with the blue square, click one more time, hit escape, and if everything's worked out properly, you should have a beige square on your screen right now with one corner at the origin. It's a square, it's five inches on each uh, side. Congratulations, you've drawn a thing. This, uh, the beige represents a closed shape, so we know it's closed because it's beige. But, I mean, I mean, what's the big deal? We came here to draw 3D objects, right? And look at this, this is about as 2D as it gets. This is, has no kind of dimensionality to it, other than the fact that it's a square. So, let's fix that. So, either click and drag your cube up here, or click the orbit tool at the bottom so that you get a view that looks roughly like this not I mean you can you can also click on the home button up here in order to bring it back into uh, perspective like that if you'd like I'll click stop sketch there we go so now we've now we're looking at it so once you've got a three-quarters view perfect <sighs> So we have to turn this two-dimensional object into a three-dimensional one. And there is a way to do that, thankfully. It's called the, uh, it's called the, uh, the press-pull tool. So the press-pull tool allows you to basically, for lack of a better term, sort of extrude uh, a shape, a two-dimensional shape, in a three-dimensional, in a third direction. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go ahead and go over here to Modify, open up the Modify menu, click on Press Pull, and I can tell you exactly what it means. So, you should see a window that looks something like this. You probably have a secondary window down here as well, that's okay. Um, that's just explaining the Press Pull tool. Um, but you, this one is the important one at the top, the smaller one, where it says Selection and No Selection. Right now we have to select what we are going to press and or pull, in this case, I guess press? Anyway, go ahead and click on your beige square. So now you should have a blue square, be it at an angle, with a blue arrow. So you can do this one of two ways. You can either drag the blue arrow up or down to either, you know, I guess press or pull, respectively. I guess that's what, you know, how it would be. Alternatively, in distance here, you can enter in a value. So I'm going to enter in 5. And hit enter. And that should automatically close the window and give us a cube. A perfect cube. 5 inches on every edge. It's 5 by 5 by 5. And making it spin. Oh my god. Okay, anyway. Um... 
one more thing we're going to do before we can consider this complete. Granted, we don't have to, but, you know, it's kind of fun. So under Modify again, we're going to click the drop-down menu on Modify. You're going to go to Appearance. Click on that. So Appearance is exactly that. It allows you to modify the appearance of this object in, you know, Final Create. Whoop. Creation. So on the appearance menu, you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of these uh, glass, metal, other paint, plastic, wood, leather, and cloth. Not all of these are going to be available. Some of them you have to download on the fly. But um, let's go with glass, smooth glass. Um, let's go with window glass. And then you can just drag and drop it onto the cube. And what it will do is it will change the, like advertised, the appearance of the cube. So now the cube is see through. If we wanted to, we could go to uh, metals, uh, aluminum, let's go with uh, anodized aluminum, glossy blue, there you go, now you got a blue cube, doesn't look amazing, but, you know, satin aluminum. This will look um, closer to, oh, I see, let's get rid of that, and let's get rid of steel satin. Delete, and delete. So now we got the satin aluminum. And there you go. Uh, that is now. If you were to, you know, export this into something else like uh, Unity or Blender or something like that, it would have the appearance of satin aluminum. Um, it's just it hasn't been fully rendered yet because this saves on processing and uh, graphics power. So it's just denoted with a color. But yes, at this point you can export it to a 3D printer as an SDL file, so you can print it out. You can export it to um, you know, a, a, a game program so you can make your own games with it. Uh, you can export it, you can save it and send it to somebody else so they can modify it. You can do whatever. This is your first, incredibly simple, albeit, but your first um, drawing first 3D object created in AutoCAD. Or, excuse me, Autodesk. Good lord. Anyway, um, since it's just about 8.50, I'm going to tell you about one more thing, and then we're going to get uh, the poll questions out there, because there's a second lesson to this, but it's... we're going to need the full hour for it. We're not going to be able to, to really get started on it right now, and then, you know, because that's just going to that's just gonna mess everything up in the future coming back to it. So, um, let me make this red aluminum. Ooh. <sighs> There's one other thing, and that's iTunes University. iTunes University is, well, it's, a, it's free classes that you can take through iTunes. It's pretty much just as the, uh, just as it sounds on the tin. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not like school classes or anything like that. They're basically little lessons. Um, little videos that you can watch uh, through your iTunes which teach you how to do specific things. That includes an Autodesk Fusion class. Uh, most of them are just little like, you know, three minute videos, but or three to five minute videos, but to, in order to do what they talk about in the video, what they teach you how to do, it can take like 15 minutes to get them done. So I would recommend you guys create an iTunes University uh, or an iTunes account, rather. Um, so you can sign up for those little lessons on iTunes University. You don't have to. Again, you don't have to. But, um... I'd recommend you do it, because it teaches you how to do some of the more complex stuff. It has some little challenges and things like that. And, uh... It's a good way to learn how to use uh, Autodesk. We're gonna go over making a gear on Wednesday. Um, so, you know, if you don't end up doing any of the auto or any of the iTunes U classes, that's fine. Uh, show of hands, how many of you have an iOS device, like an iPhone or an iPad? Okay, so for those of you who do, uh, your life is, is going to be easier. Uh, you're going to be able to take the iTunes U classes on the iPad. Um, for those of you who do not, that's fine. You can still do it on the computer. It's no big deal. 
Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I recommend you guys at least create an iTunes account so you can you can download iTunes do do that on your computer, um, or you know, look into it on iOS. If you do a search for iTunes University on Google, it should be the first result, obviously, because Apple's a fairly well-known company. Um, but that's about it, you know, experiment with things, create stuff, uh, go through the iTunes University thing, see what comes up. I'm going to ask the poll questions, and I'm going to let you guys out a few minutes early, because woohoo, that's always a nice thing, right?